Hello, and welcome to the lecture seven of this introduction to machine learning course. Today, we're going to talk about deep learning in neural networks. So that, I'm sure, sounds exciting for many of you, and it is exciting, but we are only going to spend one lecture on this topic. We don't have more time in this course, so of course we'll just you know, scratch the surface of deep learning a little bit and you will definitely need to, um, to take other courses uh, or read um, textbooks to, uh, to get to know deep learning and to get to use it in practice. Another comment is that there's so many lectures on deep learning available online because this is such a hot topic. So I was, in fact, even debating with myself, does the world need another YouTube uh, lecture on deep learning? In the end, I thought I'll make it because I want, to, I want for you to see how it fits in, the, in, in our course, you know, it, so that it doesn't look like there's a machine learning and there's a deep learning or something separate, but you see that it actually fits in and we'll just be using the same, the same concepts as everywhere else in the course when talking about that today. All right, so that said, we can start. What is deep learning? So I took a definition from a uh, deep learning textbook that just went out last year, I think, and which I can recommend for anybody who wants to, to read up on that. Um, so Goodfellow et al. In this, in this book define deep learning as uh, algorithms enabling the computer to learn complicated concepts by building them out of simpler ones. So there is an idea of hierarchy of, um, of concepts that we're building from small building blocks. That's essential in neural networks and in deep learning. So in neural networks, implement computations and in out of by building hierarchical concepts hierarchical constructs, let's say, out of small building blocks that are called neurons and that are very simple processing units. Um, and this hierarchical organization of the network allows then the, um, w once it's trained on some data, it allows it to form hierarchical representations of the data and it turns out that for many different real world problems, this hierarchical um, or hierarchical organization of patterns is actually very helpful to, to solve the tasks, as we will see uh, later on. Okay, so all of you have probably heard or know that this field had a series of huge successes during the last several, less than 10 years, let's say 10 years, from around 2012. People call it even deep learning revolution. And there's really like every year there's another big success that you hear about in the news. The last one just just a few weeks ago was that Google team solved the folding pro or made a huge progress in uh, predicting the protein structure out of the um, sequencing um, data for this protein. But in 2012, this started with a huge progress made in classifying images into cats, dogs, sheep, and cars, you know. And then you've all seen how neural networks can generate photorealistic images, um, photographs of people who don't exist and are just dreamed of by, by a network. You've heard how neural networks based reinforcement learning algorithms can teach themselves to play chess and go better than anybody in the world. Um, also, recently, you probably have heard about how a neural network can be trained to generate text that looks really, really human-like, and it's actually hard to tell apart whether um, a page of text was written by a, by a program or by a, by a human. I'm referring to GPT-3 here from OpenAI. Um, today, we're going to talk about like a little tiny corner of this field, we're going to talk about feed-forward neural networks for image classification. So in fact, this goes back to 2012 when the paper was published that really um, overtook all competitors by a very large margin in this task of classifying images into 1,000 different classes of objects that, um, that are depicted on these photographs. So we're going to talk a bit about how this worked eight years ago. All right, so in fact, in some sense, we have already in this course talked about um, a neural network, a feed-forward neural network classifier, right? I just didn't call it like that, and I'm referring here to uh, logistic regression. So let's revisit briefly logistic regression, and then we will just build up 
on this concept, adding more and more complicated steps and gradually arrive to something that looks like a, a, a real world neural network. So here's logistic regression loss function and definition copied from, from an earlier lecture that we had on this topic, right? So we have a loss, which is here, and um, this is just, so h of x is the pr probabilistic prediction that a model does that um, a given input xi belongs to um, class one, right? So this is a binary classification problem. We have class zero and class one. Think, so think about predicting cats versus dogs. And then h of x is the probability that it's a dog, for example. And then we'll just sum the log probability across all training examples of the, so whenever the real, um, the real class is a dog, then we take the log probability that the network predicts that it's a dog, and whenever it's a cat, then we take the log probability that the network, not the network, just logistic regression predicts that it's a cat, right? That's, that's very simple loss um, right over here. And then what is h of x? So our prediction, how do we form it? Well, this is it, it, it is this. It's a logistic transformation of a linear function. So we have a linear function, beta x, hidden in here, right? Right in here. And then we transform this linear combination of our predictors via the logistic transformation. So it takes any number and makes it a number between 0 and 1, which is what we want from probability passing it through the sigmoid function. Okay, um, now let me draw it like that. So for, for logistic regression, it, it, it looks a bit weird to write it like that, but you will see where I'm going at. I'm just trying to represent it a bit as a network. So I have something that in the neural network literature we would call input units or input nodes or neurons, and I have P of them. So I imagine that my, that my predictor space has P different predictors. So they are depicted here as the circles over here. Then I have an intercept term, right? So that's something that we were previously putting into the x vector as, as having just always a um, value of 1, right? So that's convenient because then we can just write beta times x and in fact the, the beta that multiplies by 1, that's just the intercept added to the model. Okay, great. So uh, for now I will draw it like that and this refers to, to this always having the value of 1 and just clip to 1. Okay, and then I'm taking these values and I'm multiplying them with some betas and I'm adding this all up. That's what this in here means, right? And I will depict it like that. So every line here has a weight and I take the value of my predictor here and I multiply it by this weight and then they all meet at this point and this means that I add them all up. And then in here, I have the value of beta transpose x. And then I write here logistic, which means that I take the result and I transform it via some function. So I take this result here and I put it through the logistic function and then I get the output. Okay, so this will be my depiction of the, of the logistic regression. Yeah, and then you can think about different, different inputs coming in here. So I have inputs here, for example, this i, this goes from 1 to n, and this is my training, training set. So you can imagine the inputs coming in here and then going through this transformation, and then you get h of x out of here, and then you compare it to the, to the true uh, value. And then you try to adapt the weights, for example, using gradient descent, so that you make as, as, as um, few mistakes or as small mistakes as possible. Okay. Um, I will also use this shorthand notation for the same thing without drawing every individual weight but just saying that we're going from, from this representation that is my input to input layer to, to this output node over here. And then there's only one output, right? H of x in this uh, case over here, H of x, that's just a scalar variable. So this is just a number that we're getting out. Okay. Um, when in statistics, talking about regression, logistic regression, anything, this beta is traditionally called coefficients, right? The coefficients in linear regression, coefficients in logistic regression. The, the, the neural network community calls the same thing weights. Um, that's why I'm using, so I will adopt this terminology, that's why I replaced beta by w here just to, 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 to emphasize, but this is, this is the same thing. So whenever a deep learning person talks about weights, you can think, about statistics person talking about coefficients. No difference. 
that's the parameters of our model, parameters that we want to, to, to uh, adapt to fit to the training data that we have. Okay, so logistic regression is a network. That is first, it's a linear network. Um, second, it only has the input layer, that's our data, and the output layer, that's H of X prediction. There's nothing else going on. It's kind of a stupid network. Still, so let, let's make it more interesting. Let's add something that is called a hidden layer. And actually, from this point on, it, it will suddenly become much more interesting. So here we have the same thing. That's the input layer, and that's the... the uh, actually, there's another term. This is sometimes called bias node in, in deep learning, in, in neural network literature. I will try to not use this term because this has nothing to do with statistical bias that we talked about earlier. But you, you may see this. So this is this intercept node, let's say. Okay, and now in the end we still want to get h of x, which is just a number, but we will we will do this in, in two steps. So first we map all of that onto, on, on, onto here, and then we'll map these here. So again, every line is one weight. We're transforming. So let's say here we, we had p nodes, right? That's the dim dimensionality of the input space. So let's say here we have, I don't know, d, uh, d nodes. And here it's only one. So this means the w2 is, is in fact just a vector of dimensionality d or d plus 1, because there's also an intercept here. Um, but w1 has, it's, it's, it's a two-dimensional matrix. It's something that transforms a p-dimensional vector into a d-dimensional vector, right? So it's a p times d matrix of weights. So you can think how many weights does this entire thing have. It's like p times d here plus d over here plus some connections going from the intercept. Okay, a more compact representation of the same thing is just that. So W1, so this is the input layer, this is the first, and in this case the only hidden layer, and this is the output layer. So you can, depending on your definitions, you can say that this network has three layers or one layer. What usually matters is how many hidden layers it has, so this only has one hidden layer. And let's now write down the, the loss for that. So we'll just use exactly the same loss. This will, never, this will not change in this lecture. Well, this loss just coming out of maximum likelihood, right, as we, as we discussed before, um, when we're making probabilistic predictions for the, binary, for the binary response variable. And I will just keep it fixed. What will change is this function, how we're actually generating these predict probabilistic predictions given the input data. And previously, I just had logistic transformation of beta times x, and now we have this. So we will, we will, this is a linear case, by the way, I didn't say that. So imagine that I'm just transforming, so this is every, every value in here is a linear combination of the inputs, and let's say I'm not doing anything else. And then the value here is the linear combination of these linear combinations, right? So we have this matrix product here, and what is a linear combination of linear combinations? Well, it's just a more complicated linear combination, right? So we gained nothing by adding a linear hidden layer inside this model. This is just equivalent to logistic regression without any difference. You can multiply W2 by W1 and call the result beta, and you're back to logistic regression. This is still not interesting. It becomes interesting only when we say that the neurons, the neurons, the nodes in the hidden layer are nonlinear, because then I cannot write it like that. Now I have to say I am forming a linear combination of the inputs, and that's W1x. Then I am passing them through a nonlinearity, that's how people call it. So I have some function phi, and I will assume it's always the same for all these neurons. That's how it usually is. So Imagine you are this, this, this guy over here. I'm, it, it computes a linear combination of all the inputs, right? This linear combination is formed here, and then this linear combination is passed through some fixed nonlinear function that I will call phi. This is done here in parallel in all these nodes, and then I can go ahead and form a linear combination over here. That's why there's a W2 over here. And W2 is just a vector, so in the end, once you computed all that, you just have one number, it's over here, and this neuron also is not a linear neuron, right? It takes this one number and passes it through its own nonlinearity, which is logistic function, and that's all this thing together, and then in the end, out of here goes 
h of x. Um, okay, so phi, what is phi? What, what function can we take as phi? And in fact, this is, this is a choice that one can make when building neural networks and different, diff there are different more or less standard choices for phi. I am going to just describe one, which is probably the most standard choice at the moment, but there are several available. So we want a function that is not, what do we want? We want a function that is not linear, obviously, as I explained. We want a function that's easy to work with mathematically. We, we will need to compute gradients of everything, so we want something that's easy to differentiate. And okay, you can choose different things. Actually, you can take logistic function. And back in the back in the 90s, in in 2000s, people usually took logistic units as for for hidden units. What is more popular right now is the function that looks like that. Um, it's even simpler. It's just actually it's almost linear. It's almost y equals x. But if x is negative, then you just output zero. Okay, so here it's just identity transformation. You don't do anything, but whenever you would get a negative number as your linear combination, you just output zero. That's the phi. So this is called a rectifier function, and the neurons that do that are called rectified linear units or ReLOS. Um, very simple. You can think already what will the derivative of this function be. So there's a little bit of a uh, not so nice thing in, in that the derivative is not defined at this point, right? However, the derivative here is just 1, and the derivative here is just 0. So it's the derivative is just a threshold. Whenever your x is positive, the derivative is 1, and below it's just 0. So that's very, um, it's actually pretty convenient to work with, despite non-smoothness over here. So there are other choices of phi uh, that, that, that are used uh, in practice, but I'm not going to mention them. We're just using ReLOS here. Now we come to, to, a, to a very interesting statement. So we now have a, a neural network with one hidden layer with the ReLU, uh, with the rectifying nonlinearity in the hidden layer. And let we can ask how, actually, what, what kind of functions can we, uh, can we get if we um, set the weights in, in any way, in, in, in any particular way. Or now, you know, you, you're changing the weights, the nonlinearity is fixed, so you change the weights in the connect going in, into the hidden layer and you change the weights that go out of the hidden layer. What can you get? What is the space of functions that this network can implement? And an amazing fact, statement, a theorem, is that actually any function can be implemented with such a network. Any continuous function, f, can be approximated to an arbitrary precision by a neural network with one hidden layer, pretty much with any nonlinearity that you can choose. So there are some conditions, specific conditions on the nonlinearity, but for example, the rectifier um, satisfies those conditions. In fact, there's, there's, it's not one theorem, but historically it's a bunch of different, uh, so several people proved more and more stronger and stronger results in this direction. And, but, but this is the how I will formulate it for now. That's what's important for us. So you choose any, any function f that you want that's continuous, and then I can give you some weights w1 and some weights w2. I cannot modify phi. So you choose the phi and you choose the f and I give you W1 and W2 that approximate F with any precision that you also give me as an epsilon, for example. So here's another way to write that, is that F can be approximated, you sometimes can see this, or will see this written like that. So these circles here, the funny circles, um, this is a notation for composition of functions. So this is W1 is a linear transformation, and then, um, so you need to read it from this side there. So this is a composition of w1, then phi, then w2, and any function can be approximated with any um, precision by that. So that sounds that sounds very strong, right? It seems why wouldn't we then, like, why do we need to do anything else? We basically we're done. We're any function that we possibly want to 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 have on our input space can be implemented by just one hidden layer. Why do we need more? And the answer is, of course, that this is a theorem that says that it's possible, but it doesn't tell you actually what the weights will be, and it doesn't tell you in particular the size of the hidden layer that you may need for that. So it may be that you need a hidden layer of enormous size to, to approximate a particular function. 
also tells you nothing about how easy it will be to find these Ws if you do something like gradient descent starting from random weights, right? So this, that's something I didn't say before. Once you added a hidden layer that is not linear, your loss function is not convex anymore. So logistic regression has a convex loss function. That's great. You choose a random solution, you run gradient descent, you arrive to the minimum. Here, in this lecture, you can forget about that. Once your model has a hidden layer, the loss is not convex, so you start somewhere, you run gradient descent, you end up in local minimum. Is it a good local minimum? Is it a bad local minimum? We don't know. There's no guarantees here. In practice, the models with one hidden layer do not perform very well. So I'm just saying that I, I'm pointing this out. I think it's important. Already just adding one hidden layer in principle increases the capacity of your, um, of your model from something that can only implement linear boundaries, decision boundaries, into something that can implement anything you possibly want. Right? It just may be actually hard to implement and hard to fit. And um, the solution to that is to go, de at least the, the, the solution that we're discussing today, is that, well, we can add more hidden layers. So what I had before, when you only had one hidden layer that's sometimes called a shallow network, and we can go deeper, and by going deeper, I just mean, well, we'll add a bunch of hidden layers, right? So, um, and this, this architecture is called a feed-forward neural network. That's what I mentioned earlier. Um, there are no connections that go back. There are no loops in this in this graph. There are n networks with loops. They're called recurrent neural networks. We're not talking about them today. So this is a feed-forward neural network. You enter the input over here, then goes to the next layer, then goes to the next layer, then goes to the next layer, and then you get the output. Right? It's a very, very simple modular architecture. And then we assume that all phi's, so the activation of the hidden uh, in the hidden layers are all the same everywhere here. So the only thing that you need to specify if you want to specify this network and you already chose some phi like a rectifier, uh, like a relu, you just need to say how many neurons you want to have here and how many neurons you want to have here and how many neurons you want to have here and how many hidden layers of which size you want to have. Then you stack them together and you're done. This specifies your model then. Let's write down the... Um, the loss for this model, again, this doesn't change. What changes is our prediction h of x. And I will, I will just write it explicitly here, but you see that um, like the, the expression becomes a bit ugly, but it's very, very simple in a sense, right? You take the x, multiply it with w1, then you pass through nonlinearity, multiply with w2, pass through nonlinearity, multiply by w3, and again, and again, and once you multiply by w4, which is in this case just a vector, Right, you get just one single number in the end, and you pass it finally through the logistic function. You get your output, and you're done. Okay, so in some sense, in some sense, it's kind of still logistic regression, but it has this now deep process. Well, it, it is not logistic. That, that that's not correct because, as I said before, logistic regression is is a generalized linear model. It's linear because this thing over here that's now in in, in red color that used to be linear, and this is not anymore. So this is not a linear function of the parameters. For example, this parameter over here, after it passed through all these consecutive nonlinearities, of course, this is, this is nothing, nothing linear anymore. Um, OK, so what do we do with that? We, we want to fit it to the data, right? How did we do it with logistic regression? We had some training data. We compute the gradient of our loss, and we just run the gradient descent, and, and, and th that's it. Um, we, that's what we want to do here. We want to do the same thing. We want, and f to be able to run the gradient descent, we need to get the gradient. So now we need to discuss how to compute these gradients over here. And as a reminder, this is the gradient of logistic regression. Go back to the, that lecture if, you, uh, if you're unsure how that works. That's, that's pretty important. So when you differentiate the, this loss, that doesn't change here in this lecture. Then you get this, and then you have the gradient of this, whatever was whatever goes inside the logistic function, right? And in this case, the gradient of beta x is just x, the gradient with respect to parameters, of course, right? That's just x, so here you have it. That's the gradient of the for of the logistic regression. We now have this monster over here that 
we need to take the, the gradient off. So this formula still is the same, but now instead of gradient of that, we need a gradient of that. And we need a, so what is the gradient? That's just partial derivatives. So we need partial derivatives of this with respect to this w, this w, this w, and this w. And you can imagine that this is becoming pretty messy to, to compute these derivatives. We will still do it, right? That's a useful exercise. We will do it. And in order to do it, it's actually easier, I find, at least for me, or I thought it's pedagogically easier to write it down in, in coordinates. So here I'm writing it as just matrix, acting on a matrix. Um, I will write it down, everything in coordinates, because I think it's easier to compute derivatives there. Um, so every matrix multiplication is a sum. Over, it becomes a sum over here, and all these A, B, C, D, these are indices that you sum over when you multiply two matrices together, right? Um, so you can start unpacking it from, from, from inside, and here we just have a uh, matrix transforming a vector, xi is, is a particular training sample, and out of here comes a, another vector, right? So we went from dimensionality P, that's our input dimensionality, to dimensionality whatever in the second layer. Uh, the dimensionality is. So we, 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 we've got a vector over here, then you pass it through nonlinearity, and by the way, this just means that every element of this vector is transformed with this, with this nonlinearity. Okay, and out comes another vector, then you multiply it with another matrix, out comes another vector, and so on until here, when you have a vector that's multiplied by the vector, and you get a scalar output that I will just call Z, and the Z is just all this entire thing over here. Okay, th this is not a gradient yet. This is just rewritten, the same thing, rewritten in coordinates. So how do we compute these derivatives? Well, uh, it's actually not, conceptually, it's not complicated. We just need to use the chain rule. And uh, so I wrote down the chain rule here, but in fact, I already used it before. So for example, when computing this, how did we compute this derivative? If you go back to that lecture five, you will see that we use the chain rule, right? You take the derivative of the loss, within is the logistic, so then you take the derivative of the logistic, within the logistic stand, stand is the beta x, so then you need to take the derivative of beta x. That's why you have this term over here. Um, so this is just a chain rule, like it's known for, I don't know, 300 years. And that's what we are going to use to compute the derivatives of that. So we will, on the next slide, which is going to be a bit of a messy slide, I'm going to take this, this expression and I will try to compute the partial derivatives with respect to different, different double. So let's try to do that. Um, so that's the same expression as we had before, right? And now we start to compute partial derivatives. Um, okay, let's just do it. So it's easier for the Ws that are closer here to the left. Okay, so if you want a derivative, a partial derivative of this guy with respect to W4, a particular element of W4, I call it here 4A. So note that in this expression, A is something that I sum over. Here I don't sum, I just say what is the derivative of this with respect to W4 element, I don't know, 5. So you can plug 5 instead of the A, and this will give you the partial derivatives of the fifth with respect to the fifth core uh, element of W4 vector, okay? Okay, so, well, this is actually just a linear combination in over here, right? So it's the sum of these Ws times something, and if you want the derivatives, then you just choose the, the element that corresponds to the A you want, and this something is your derivative, just a linear function that you take the derivative of. So that's super easy. You just get this entire phi uh, of whatever is inside, that's your derivative. You're done here. That's pretty simple. Let's then we proceed to the second term. So what do we do here? Okay, now we need a chain rule. Here enters the chain rule. We're saying that derivative with respect to that, again, we have A in here, so this sums just falls out. And um, inside, we need the derivative. How do we do that? That's the derivative of this entire thing with respect to this phi, and that's just this W, W4. So it gets in here. Then you need to take... That's the chain rule. Now you need the derivative of phi with respect to whatever is inside. So you get this guy over here. Pause for a second here, and remember that derivative of phi is either 0 or 1. That's all. 
So in fact, this, this looks like a complicated expression. I even just put dots, dot, dot, dot in there, but this can only be either zero or one. So if it's zero, then you're just done. Everything is zero, you don't need to compute it anymore. Um, and if it's one, it just falls out. It's one, right? So that's actually simpler than it looks. Okay, but then we need the derivative of what is inside that phi with respect to this w, and that's again just this second layer phi. Okay, so that's it. We, com we, we, we computed it. And now we can continue this exercise and compute the derivative with respect to w, uh, what is it, w2. So I will stop explaining every step here. You just see that then you apply the chain rule one more, um, one you, like you go one level down when applying the chain rule, and uh, this sum actually now survives because you know, I only have B, C uh, entries here, so I, I have to sum over A, and then you get something like that. So at least no, I, I mark in this um, um, in this uh, brick color everything that I get from the chain rule, and and this is kind of a leftover in a sense. It's also from the chain rule, but. Um, That's kind of a part of the part of the expression that we don't need to 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 decompose further here. And finally, we get the derivative with respect to the first layer weights, and then you get this all the way down. Then you don't have any black color anymore because you need to compute the derivative of this most inner thing with respect to W, which is just x. So you have x here, and then you're done. So this looks like a like a tonal mass, but in fact. It's pretty, like conceptually, it's pretty simple. Of course, if you want to implement that, you, you, it's a pain because you need to take care of that all the indices are correct and so on, if you're actually implementing from scratch. But conceptually, it's not very, it's not very complicated. This is not backpropagation yet. So everybody heard about backpropagation. You know that neural networks are trained uh, using backpropagation. This, I, I didn't mention it yet because this is just application of the chain rule. And in fact, you can compute every, so in order to do gradient descent, you need to compute this derivative with respect to every single W weight that you have in your model. So you just do that with these formulas, then you update every weight in the direction, like using the gradient descent step in the direction of its corresponding derivative, right? No backpropagation here yet. Backpropagate, what is backpropagation? This is just an, a, a smart way, an efficient algorithm to compute all these derivatives um, efficiently, you know? Because if you look at that, you see that many expressions here appear several times. So naively, if you just compute that, and then you compute this, and then you compute that, um, you will be repeating, repeating some calculations over and over and over again. And for a large network, this is super inefficient. Uh, so looking at it closer, you see that you can actually con compute these red parts starting from the top here, because here, well, here's nothing to compute. Here you have this thing. Imagine you already computed that, this only the red part. Then when you need this object here, this is the same. You just now sum it over A with this additional thing over here. So you took something that you already computed and sum over, and then you have this entire thing. And then when you go on that level, you have this entire thing over here, and you multiply by something else, and you sum it additionally. And if you look at that, this happens from the top layer in the network, so from the, from the, the fourth layer in my example. And then we we'll proceed to the third, and to the second, and to the first. So you can compute all these derivatives, all these parts that come out of the chain rule. You can compute them by first computing them for the W4, for all elements of W4, and then you combine this in mul with, with additional multiplying by something else to compute the derivatives for W3, and then you combine those, like you, you sum them over with additional weights that come out of in the on the third layer, and you proceed from the end to the to the in towards the input, and that's called a backward pass through the network. And this can be implemented actually very neatly as a loop over layers that gives you all these gradients. Um, in fact, much simpler than this explicit derivation if you're reusing the previously the chunks that you previously had. 
So there's a forward pass and a backward pass. Forward pass, if you just want to compute the output, the first line over here, you do a forward pass. You take the inputs, multiply them by the weights, by uh, pass them through phi, another weights, another phi, another weights, another phi. That's a forward pass through the network. And then when you want to compute the gradient, it's efficient to do it by using a backward pass. That's why it's called back propagation. Um, okay, so the summary of that is the back propagation is just an efficient way to implement a chain rule. And there's different ways to um, to explain or introduce back propagation. One can do it more abstractly um, by by just explaining how we I need to combine the gradients on level like L to get the gradients of the level L minus one. That's another way to explain that. I thought it's it will be clearer if I write it down like very explicitly for this for this example. I'm not sure if it's actually more helpful or not, but um, that's what it is. Okay. Great. So now we know how to compute the gradient of this layered uh, hierarchical model feedforward neural network. So what do we do with it? We we just run gradient descent. You know that. There's two notes, uh, two remarks that um, I want to briefly make on this slide, but won't have time to um, to discuss further. Even though, like, probably each of them could be a lecture. So, first of all, usually or very often, it's not just the gradient, like the raw vanilla gradient descent, uh, that is used to train neural networks. This first, the the learning rate. Um, there, there, is, there are many algorithms that adaptively change the learning rate such that the learning rate for different weights can be different. Like if you see that one weight is not updated a lot, then you maybe inc want to increase the learning rate over there. Um, so algorithms like Adam, for example, and, and, and many others are the algorithms that try to make smart changes to the learning rate adaptively depending on how the weights behaved in the previous gradient descent iterations, okay? Um, and then another another thing that is very common is something called momentum. So momen if you imagine that you have some lost surface and you imagine yourself like being sitting on this lost surface and then the gradient points down, so you make a step downwards and then you're in a new place and now a gradient points a bit different direction and you go there, that's what gradient descent does, right? So the momentum term basically keeps track of the previous directions that you followed and doesn't allow you to deviate very, very fast from it. So if you, if you were going downwards in that direction and then suddenly the gradient point points to the right, gradient descent, vanilla gradient descent, would just go to the right immediately. If you have a momentum term, uh, it's some compromise between keeping to go, going in the same direction as before and going to the right suddenly. This makes your trajectory like optimization trajectory smoother in some sense and can help actually a lot um, because the tr the, this optimization path is less noisy then. Okay, and so this is the, second, the second remark is that in fact gradient descent as, as, as I introduced it previously is not used. Uh, there's another sense in which gradient descent is not used, and that's because something called stochastic gradient descent is, is used instead in practice. And that's easier to explain in a sense, because the gradient descent, as, as we had it in previous lectures, contains, like, y you're computing the gradients with respect to weights by summing over the entire training set. Right? The gradient depends on the training data, obviously. So I always had this sum over i, in, in the gradient uh, formulas. So I need to take my entire data set, put them through these formulas, and then I get the gradient, and then I make an update. If you have a lot of data, this actually will take a lot of time to compute the gradient just by summing over this entire da training data set. And you need to do this on the every, every gradient descent step. So it's pretty expensive to compute. What usually is done in when training neural networks is to use small so-called batches of the training data. So you have a training data that maybe has a million examples. You split it into batches that are pretty small, that maybe have 10 examples or 100, let's say. So you take 
small hundred examples randomly out of your out of your entire training set, and then you compute the gradient by just summing over these hundred examples. Okay, this gives you some direction, and you go make a step in that direction. Then you take the next hundred examples, you and for the next gradient descent step, you look at the next at the gradient that you get when you sum over this next uh, next batch. Okay, and then you make the next then you take the next patch and the next patch and the next patch so each gradient descent step that you're doing is using a different part of the uh, of the training data as long as you still have them so at some point you run out of batches and that's called an epoch so now you actually s you you went over your entire training data but you didn't make just one step you already made I don't know, it's sometimes it's a lot. You already maybe made a thousand steps because you had a thousand batches there. So the stochastic, the word stochastic in stochastic gradient descent means it means that that actually you never follow the the full gradient that the training set would allow you to compute in principle. You always like follow some approximation to that that you get from different random batches of your data. Okay, so what happens when you ran through all the batches? You just do it again. So, and, and, and usually the length of the training is measured in epochs. So how many, in the tr you, can, you can find statements in the papers like the network was trained for 100 epochs. That just means that there were some small batches, you loop through the training set and then you do this again, and then you do this again, you do this 100 times, that's 100 epochs, okay? So that's SGD, stochastic gradient set for you. Okay, another remark. If we now go back to this 2012 paper that um, that showed how a deep neural network can be super successful in uh, classifying images, then they did it on a data set that's called ImageNet that has photos, like small photos of different objects, and there's a lot and a lot and a lot of different classes, as I said before. There's a cars and, and different animals and different breeds of dogs and, and whatnot, and you need, given an image, tell what class it is. So it's not a binary classification problem. There's not 10 classes. There's, I think there's a thousand different classes. Um, so we talked, in fact, about that briefly when in the lecture on, on uh, logistic regression, right? If there are K classes, then you just replace the logistic nonlinearity with the so-called softmax nonlinearity. Um, and each of the softmax units predicts the probability that it belongs to, to class K. And then you can very uh, easily replace the loss function that you had for just two classes to any number of classes. And every time you just take the logarithm of the probability that the model predicts for this particular class. That so if it's if it's a picture of a of of a ship, you know, then you take the log probability that your model set is a ship, and that that enters the loss, and you just sum over all training samples. Um, I will not explain this in more detail, but that's actually exactly the same for the multinomial logistic regression. It can be exactly the same way implemented in a neural network. Okay, what I do still want to talk about today is something called convolutional neural networks. Because in fact, all these image classification tasks or not classification, all the image-based tasks in deep learning use a convolutional architecture. So that's very important to understand. And um, so the CNNs, convolutional neural networks, used something called weight sharing. You can, so why? Maybe first conceptually, why do we want weight sharing? Because if you have a photo and you need to say if, if it's a photo of a dog or not. The dog can be in different places on the photo, right? So you want something like a dog detector, and if a dog is in this corner, the dog detector should say it's a dog, but if it's in that corner, it should also say it's a dog, right? So it doesn't matter. There's a translation invariance. You can move the dog around on an image, and the dog detector should say exactly the same um, probability that it's a dog in, in all of them. And this is not necessarily the case if you if you have normal like logistic regression model because there each pixel is its own predictor right so if you if you have an image and a dog is over here that's a very different vac input vector from from a picture where the dog is over here and um, the model will not, not necessarily pick it up like 
build a translationary invariant model. So we can just hard build this translation invariance into the model, and that's what we achieve by this convolutional architecture. So let's say this is an input image, okay? So this is the width, this is the height, these are individual pixels, and then I, this, this is just explains one layer of a neural network, the convolutional layer. I'm, and I will do the following. I will say I'm looking at a small patch of this image here, three times three. I'm forming a linear combination of these pixels. So I have nine weights. I multiply the values in here, just the colors, um, the, the, the color intensity over here by these nine weights, and I sum it all up, and that's the value over here. So that's normal feed forward thing. I'm fully connected neural network like within here so far, right? I have nine weights for these nine pixels. But then I go to the right here and I'm taking the next patch of nine pixels and I'm applying the same identical weights to get to a value over here. So that's the crucial part. That's why it's called weight sharing. I'm using the same, I have like a, it's called a kernel. I have this convolutional kernel of nine, uh, of three times three size that has nine weights and I, I uh, sweep it through the image like everywhere here, you know, and always compute this linear combination using the same weights, hoping that maybe this is, for example, a dog detector or something else detector, and then I just sweep it through the picture and I always see if, it, if, if this looks like a dog or not, as a very, uh, as a, as a very simple example, of course. Uh, you won't be able to linearly detect whether it's a dog or not, but that's the idea. So you, you use the same kernel everywhere, and then you arrive over here, and this process is, is, is called a convolution. This is a convolutional layer. And then usually what happens here, and then of course the, if you do it like that, then the value here and the value close to it will, will be similar often, will be similar at least. So what is done in practice is to, this is called a step called max pooling, and what it does is just I'm taking now in this here, in this convolutional layer, I take all the elements over there and I just choose the maximum of them and output over here. And then I move this thing over here, this, this window, choose the maximum here and, 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 and put it in there. And the size of this layer, like the width times, uh, width times height, is smaller than before. And this is just because it's, it's very expensive to... Um, uh, to we want to reduce the this, the size of the thing we're processing because we have so many layers you know we will have so many weights we want at least the this size to go down so all of that picture actually describes just what is called in 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 CNNs just a one layer it's a convolution plus max pooling and then in the end maybe here you had a 200 times 200 image and here you maybe have it just a 50 times 50 image that you uh, that you get out of that. Well, image, it's not really an image anymore, but it's 50 times 50 output. Now, there's two, mm, two things uh, that make it more complicated, actually. First is that if an image was in color, then you have R, G, and B channels, right? So you have an entire two-dimensional picture in the red channel and an entire two-dimensional picture in the green and in the blue channel. So, in fact, the input is like a three-dimensional, in a sense, with three different um channels it's called channels in 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 here so how do we deal with that well this actually means that my kernel is not three times three it's three times three times three right so i take this entire 27 numbers in here and then i have 27 weights and i multiply 27 numbers in the image with 27 weights and i add them up and that's the linear combination it gets in here okay then i slide this kernel through the image, then I do the max pooling by taking the maxima to reduce the size of the image, and then I put this, of course, through the nonlinearity, which may be the real nonlinearity, and then I'm done with this one layer. And that's still not exactly that, because I don't want to use only one kernel. Maybe I have a kernel that is a dog detector, um, but I also want a cat detector, you know? So I, I want to have a bunch of different kernels that slide through the image, and that's what's going to happen here. So I have one kernel, and then 
another, and then another, and let's say I have 10 different kernels, so I do exactly the same thing in parallel 10 times, and then I over here I get 10, it's called feature maps. So the thing over here got, in a way, it's like RGB channels here, now I have 10 channels here that corresponds to these different kernels that I was using, and then they survive for the max pooling, and I have this three-dimensional block over here. So all of that is just, and then the uh, rectify nonlinearity. And all of that is just one layer of the convolutional neural network. So here's how a convolutional neural network in its entirety may look like. Actually, a very simple one. Usually, you have more layers. You start with an image. It has three channels. You go over here. For example, it can have um, like 64, 128, something like that, um, feature maps and a smaller size. Then you do this again, like in exactly the same way. You go one, you, you have another hid convolutional hidden layer. So you now have these three dimensional kernels that slide here in two dimensions. And you usually you keep increasing the feature maps until you have, I don't know, it can be a thousand or even more of different, um, of different feature maps in this layer. And the size of the image, like the physical size, shrinks number of feature maps grows, then you have a bunch of these blocks, these are all hidden layers, and then in the very end, at some point you say, okay, I'm done with convolutions, now I just take all the values inside in this three-dimensional object and I just put them here in one dimension, and now I will just have a normal feed-forward non-convolutional network where I'm just forming any linear combination of these things to get here, and then to get here, and by this I denote a softmax layer that corresponds to the thousand classes, for example, that I want to predict. So this is how the convolutional neural network um, typically works. You can get rid of fully connected layers and just use fully convolutional network. That's possible. You can combine, you can choose all these sizes. You know, it's a bit like playing, when you're building a network like that, it's a build like, like a playing a, 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 a Lego. You're, um, um, you construct it out of these building blocks, and no, only practice can tell you what is more efficient. Have more feature maps here, or maybe have uh, less, f f fewer uh, feature maps over there, but then take this block and replicate it five times to have five additional hidden layers. So you construct it somehow, and then you run gradient descent, you see what you get. Um, one note, maybe, on the convolutional architecture here, in a sense, one can imagine the same architecture fully connected. This means that I'm not saying, like without weight sharing, I'm mapping this over here in the, in the, here in the convolutional uh, neural, in, in the CNN, and I'm using the same weights for all these mappings, but I can say whatever, I'm just connecting all pixels from here to all neurons from there, which is a lot of different weights then, many more, and, and I do this everywhere, and in a sense, the picture will stay the same, but it can be now fully connected. This is, will be a much, much, much more complicated model than the CNN, because this reduces the number of weights by a lot, because all these weights have to be the same here, right? I'm just, I'm just, I'm using the, this kernel that has only, as I said, be in the example before, 27 weights, and I apply it everywhere, but it's always the same 27 weights. Uh, so you can see convolutional neural network as a very strong simplification of the fully connected neural network with the same architecture. Um, or in a sense, you can see it as a very strong prior, like infinitely strong prior, that says that the weights in different parts of the image in this layer should be the same. And in fact, you can put a particular regularization in the network without making it explicitly convolutional and something similar to convolutional um, structure will emerge from this regularization. So one can conceptually, I think, see convolutional, uh, convolutional structure that you put in here as a kind of regularization, but super useful regularization if you're working with images. Okay, what do CNNs learn? I, I, I want to show a few, few images here. So if you train this kind of network on an actual data set with images, then what happens in the first layer is pretty interesting, I think, and it's very easy to visualize because in the first layer, you take these, um, you take these little patches, right, and uh, uh, that's your kernel. So for each, for each kernel in the feature map, you can just directly pl plot 
how this patch looks like. It's like an, the kernel on the first layer is like an image itself. So if there is a 96 feature maps on the first hidden layer, then I can just plot this 96, um, 96 kernels as images. And here's what comes out. And it's pretty remarkable because always in any, in all CNN architectures, trained a bit differently, what always happens in the first layer is that you get these kind of uh, kernels that um, like uh, f like Fourier components uh, in the spatial domain or like Gabor, it's called also Gabor filters. It actually reminds how the, uh, how some neurons in the retina process the, um, are tuned to, um, to, the, to the world, you know? So it's pretty interesting, I think, that, that, that this um, comes out of training a convolutional neural network with, with gradient descent. You get some color patches also. But that's on the first layer. That's very easy to see. What is much more complicated is to analyze is what happens in the hidden layers. Because once you are like far into the hierarchy and you're asking, okay, here I'm in the fifth hidden layer. What does this neuron do? It's really hard to answer because it's 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 not clear how to how to yeah how to even begin answering this question. And there's a lot of research actually that tries to do that. So you you train a neural network, you you are happy with how it performs then you fix this neural network and then you kind of do you know the biology of neural network you go in the neuroscience of neural network w trying to understand in words what different neurons and different layers may be doing so that's an active area of research which i find fascinating and you can read up on that a lot and then maybe there's a neuron that looks like it's a dog detector um but maybe it looks like it like it fires a lot when you show a picture of a dog, but does it really detect a dog, or does it just de detect uh, like a nose of the dog? Maybe it's a snout detector. So if you cut out the the nose, then it will stop firing. Or something that looks like a roof detector, maybe a sky detector. And so very often, um, I it's not easy to to answer this. But uh, I think if you look at a network carefully enough and you analyze it carefully enough, you can um, figure a lot of that out. But it isn't easy. But these are beautiful images, and you can uh, you can like navigate through the network, go to different layers, see how, how what different neurons respond to. It's 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 fascinating. So I totally recommend playing around with that. Um, okay, some historical remarks here. So we we're, we're getting towards the end of this lecture. A funny thing is that neural networks, convolutional neural networks, backpropagation, all of that in a sense was invade, invented a lot of time, like a long time ago. It was invented, uh, people argue about who exactly invented backpropagation, but it happened in the 60s or 70s or 80s maybe, long time ago. So why did it take until 2010s, like 2012, to actually become so popular as it is now? And in fact, there's no easy answer to that, I think. Usually people say, well, one ingredient is computing power. We now have these powerful GPUs that allow us to train these gigantic networks. And before we had that, it wasn't clear if this is actually going to be fruitful or not. Another ingredient is that you need large, very large, labeled data sets. So ImageNet consists of millions of images that have a label. You did not have that uh, 20 years ago, let alone 40 years ago. And that's essential to train a deep neural network. You need to have a lot of data. And then there are all these different tricks, of many of which I didn't even mentioned today, like how exactly you optimize, like you use momentum or not, how you initialize the weights, this may matter and actually does matter a lot, what regularization you use, like things like dropout uh, and other things that again I didn't mention today, normalization and so on. There's a lot of different tricks that people use that turn out to, to help with training. I think usually people would argue that the first two things are more important than the last that what actually made a big difference is the rapid increase in the computing power uh, where the networks can be implemented and that this large amount of labeled data appeared um, and, and, and could be used. But I think it's like a positive feedback loop between, between all three, right? The network started to show some promising results and then so many people started working on that or more and more the better the results got and all these tricks got invented and so on. So. Hard to say what exactly actually started this process, but it was a combination of all of that. And another thing, it's pretty, in, in some sense, it is obvious that you can take a deep neural network and it will have a very 
like it has millions, uh, many, many millions of parameters if it's deep enough. So of course it can, it's a very expressive model and you can run gradient descent on that, that's clear. What is not a priori clear is that first it will not get stuck in some useless local minimum, that it will actually get somewhere that is useful, that maybe is not exactly the real global minimum, but it's good enough. That is not obvious. And uh, the second thing is whether it will not overfit very badly because you have such an expressive model, maybe it will just overfit, uh, like, you know, if it's deep enough, uh, so badly that the test performance will be awful. And these things are not a priori clear, and maybe if you go back 30 years and you ask whether this will happen, then maybe many people would say, yeah, there's no, there's no hope because it will get stuck. No, there's no hope because it will just overfit if it's big enough. Now we know that this doesn't happen. Uh, and this was like empirically, uh, empirically found out. A few words on this overfitting and regularization issue. So we, we spent a lot of time in previous lectures talking about um, talking about overfitting and how you can regularize the model, the linear regression, logistic regression, and so on, and how important this is. And it is also important for neural networks too. So you can do different approaches to, there are different approaches to regularizing neural networks of which I cannot, like, I cannot cover them uh, in this lecture. You can use rich regularization. You just add this term to each layer. That's actually super simple. It's usually done even by default maybe in, in, in neural networks. It's called weight decay for the reasons that I explained back in lecture four. Um, usually it doesn't play a huge role though in this setting. So like for example, the, to tune the lambda parameter, surprisingly, if you do rich regression, it's, it's very important which lambda you choose, right? And we discussed all these bias variance trade-offs. Here usually doesn't play a huge role as it turns out. Another thing that I will talk about is called early stopping and in a way that's also a regularization approach. Um, so I want to show you a plot of what, like a sketch of what happens when you train a network. So I have epochs on the horizontal axis. So I start with some loss over here on the training set and then I run my gradient descent and my loss improves and improves and improves and improves and improves and always improves for the training data. What happens for the validation data or the test data? My loss also improves because my model gets better and then at some point it starts decreasing, it starts, it starts getting worse, worsening again because, I mean, this means that we are overfitting, right? That's, that's what overfitting is, that there's a gap between the training and the validation and it increases. Um, so if you train the network long enough, you start overfitting. So that's pretty interesting. And in fact, one can, s one can show that if you do this for linear regression and you just run gradient descent on linear regression, then in fact, you what, what is in some sense, what is learned by gradient descent first corresponds to large singular um, vectors in the SVD decomposition of X for, this, for the linear model. And then later on, you start picking up on the small singular values. So if you stop training at some point, even though on the training set you could still get better, but you just stop after, after s some number of epochs, then this has an effect that is similar to the reach penalty because as we discussed, reach penalty also just penalizes small singular values. That is for linear model. For nonlinear model, deep neural network is really, it's impossible, or at least we don't know how to analyze this mathematically, but the same thing happens. You fit, 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 and then at some point, or often, not always, often, you start to overfit if you train more. So what people do is that they keep training the network and they look at the validation loss and whenever it starts going up, then you stop and you say, okay, this is my model. So the number of epochs to train becomes a regularization parameter. That's pretty interesting. Um, another comment and the final series of comments on the over parameterization in, in neural networks. So the modern neural networks are typically huge. They are enormous they are so large that they can actually fit, you would expect that they can fit pretty much anything in the, in the training data. They can overfit the, the training set. They can fit, they can, you can train them until the error on the training set becomes zero or near zero. If you just, if you take a real data set like ImageNet or like a small part of that and you train your network and you get to, to the loss that is close to zero, then you don't really know if you overfit or not because maybe you just 
you build a very good model. You can check that by taking some data and shuffling the labels randomly. So I mean, by that I mean I take some part of the, uh, I take some image data set and I take the labels, cat, dog, horse, uh, a car, and I just shuffle them so that every, every image is labeled randomly now. And then I train neural network on that nonsense data set. And it turns out that if you use the same architecture as, as is normally used and you train long enough, you can get to the training loss of zero or close to zero. So it will just overfit, it will just memorize for each image what this label is, even though the labels are nonsense. And this is a clear si sign that the capacity of the model is so large that it just overfits the data. I mean, this just depends on the sample size and the model complexity, but this basically is this P much larger than N regime that we discussed before for linear models. And neural networks, Probably not all of them, probably not for all data, but very often they are in this over-parameterized regime in practice. At the same time, so you train them, your, your loss goes close to zero on the training set, but your generalization performance is still high. It still performs pretty well. It can tell dogs from cats from, from cars on the left out holdout validation data or the test data. So this is what I call benign or what people call benign overfitting. You do overfit in some sense, but in some other sense you don't because your test performance is pretty good. And this only happens because the, there is some implicit regularization in the, in the process. By how the network is structured and by how it's trained with gradient descent, we arrive at a solution that doesn't just memorize all the labels in the training set and can't generalize at all, even though that would be possible as this shows, we arrive to a meaningful solution. It's like a linear regression we talked about in the over-parameterized regime, there are different beta hat vectors. So here there are different weights that can fit the training data equally well, but somehow the neural network arrives at a good set of weights that does generalize. And why exactly this happens is an active area of research, fascinating research, and I think largely still um, not understood or very poorly understood apart from you can analyze this in very simple toy situations but why does it happen all the time for these deep networks nobody really knows but um, yeah but that's important okay um, a funny thing happens that you can sometimes see um, in the whenever you have a deep classifier that you overfit the loss with training, as, as, as I showed in the previous slide, right? So this is epochs again on the horizontal axis. Your loss, and this is a test loss here, goes down and then goes up. So here you start overfitting by training more. But if you look at the accuracy, which just goes from zero to 100%, it grows up and then it keeps growing, or at least it plateaus. So we see here that the loss goes up, we means we do start to overfit, but somehow you don't see this in the accuracy. So that's a curious thing that actually very often happens in practice. And the reason it happens can be understood even in the logistic regression itself. I briefly touched on that in the lecture on logistic regression. Um, that's what happens when you can when you can, uh, when 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 your classes are actually completely separated for logistic regression linearly, it you run a gradient descent and the logistic regression finds a good direction to tell one class from another, and once it found it, it can predict everything perfectly on a training set, which means it becomes more and more and more confident, becomes overconfident. The this corresponds to beta vector growing, the norm of it growing to infinity. And then the loss on the test set goes up because you're too confident, but the accuracy actually doesn't change, even on the test set. So it's a curi curious effect that I wanted to mention here. And the last figure for today is that one way to look at this over-parameterization issue is to say, well, what happens if I make the network deeper and deeper, or maybe the hidden layers wider and wider, and I start from a really small network that can't fit the data very well. So this is then the model complexity axis, and it can, so imagine that you have a fixed neural network and you just make the hidden layers wider. And this will correspond to moving here on the right. So what happens to the test loss? Well, here you are underfitting, you have low variance, you have high bias, the performance is bad, then the model becomes more complicated, here the performance increases. And then at some point you get to this regime that you have high variance solutions and the low bias, but high variance until you reach 
this interpolation threshold, as we call it, for linear models. So here, beyond this, your model capacity is so, so large that you can fit any, th any data you throw in, even the random data. And amazingly, uh, this curve then goes down. So again, I mentioned that even for linear models, this can happen. Uh, it, it happens in practice for, for deep networks all the time. So the, this goes down again, and not only it goes down, but actually it can go, it, it can get below, uh, below this point. So actually it's the most advantageous, it's the, the you, you get the best test performance by, ha by getting in this, what could seem as a hopelessly over-parameterized regime, right? And this only works because there's some magic implicit regularization, somehow, we don't fully understand how, built into the gradient descent and model architecture that despite this over-parameterization gives you a good set of weights that do generalize. Okay, so I want to finish with that as, as a kind of little mystery, or a huge mystery, actually, um, and that also makes it clear that this is a very ongoing research. We have these models, they work amazingly well, they, they drive the cars and, and fold the proteins, but in some sense we don't really understand how they work. Thank you. <laughs>